Well, thanks very much, Phil, and it's great to be back here again uh, at Stanford. I was a graduate student here in 1970. Uh, and my son, Joseph, who's a member of the Youth Leadership Dialogue, was uh, at his undergraduate degree and master's here in symbolic systems not so long ago, and went off to be in a Stanford startup. So Stanford is uh, kind of runs in the blood, I guess. Uh, and the ALD, of course, uh, this is um, now seems to be like one of the main things I do in life is uh, follow Phil around and, uh, and attend these things. So Phil asked me to actually prepare a talk I've never done before, so um, I've been doing a lot of research on it, which is to really try to give you a framework for thinking about where we're going over the next 20, 30, maybe even 50 years uh, as we confront um, the largest challenge that humankind collectively has ever faced, which is the change in the climate that we're inducing, and how we can possibly think about meeting the goals that our countries are now setting uh, to reduce our emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And in particular, what I've learned is that the role of information uh, uh, and communication technologies is going to be critical to that. So what I'm going to do is try to not spend much time on the problem because the governments of the world have concluded it is a problem and therefore set laws in motion that um, are going to drive a lot of our agenda for many decades. But I'll just, uh, since we have Tony Hamet here, um, an Australian who I was on co-chair of the search committee that hired him to be the head of our Scripps Institute of Oceanography and I've been very pleased with that. Uh, the result. Tony and I collaborate on uh, a lot of things. Uh, Scripps, as you know, is, is probably the most uh, important graduate research uh, facility on the oceans and on the planet. And uh, Ramanathan uh, is one of the great scientists at SIO. Uh, he's a, a person who's quite deep and has taken a very careful look at all the evidence um, uh, such as being produced by the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, but then has done a lot of original research of his own uh, and is one of the real drivers of this. And his conclusion in a paper that just came out in September is that the <clears throat> greenhouse gases that have been added to the atmosphere already, and they tend to stay in the atmosphere once they're there for at least 100 years, if not longer, um, will induce a temperature change of 2.4 degrees. Now, there's an uncertainty, and you do hear that there is uncertainty among the scientists in exactly how much. Uh, we have more scientists working on this problem collectively than any other problem that's ever been tackled by scientists uh, internationally. But, uh, and there's always uncertainty from lack of measurements, uh, uh, supercomputer simulations, and everything else. But the best distribution of that uncertainty is that black curve you see there. And that's the amount of additional warming since 1750 with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And you can see that it could be, you know, as high as four to six degrees, which would be catastrophic in terms of the changes that it would uh, yield. Uh, but more likely, um, it's around uh, to 2.4 degrees. Now, that's actually a lot compared to what we've observed. So far, we've got about 0.6, 0.8 degree centigrade uh, warming that's actually occurred. So the question is, if the greenhouse gas is in the atmosphere, how come all we've seen is this smaller portion, only a quarter of the actual amount that should be uh, occurring? Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. 90% of this already committed to warming is going to occur in this century during the time that the governments are saying we're going to have to be doing these different things. Now, why does it matter? Well, up here um, are points of temperature change at which tipping points are reached for major uh, climatic change on the Earth. As you know, the Arctic ice is getting smaller and smaller each year, and that's because we are here, and when you get here, 
essentially the Arctic summer ice will disappear entirely. And so we're already moving toward that. And you can see the change is happening. Even before you get to the tipping point, you can see we're moving in the direction that that will be the end result. Uh, much more important for humans, uh, probably at, you know, close to a half of them, uh, they get all their fresh water, and this is from India all the way to China, Southeast Asia, from the rivers, uh, from the Indus to the Yella to the Yangtze, that come from the snow melt to the Himalayas, or just in the Himalayas, and um, in Tibet. As that warming occurs, there'll be less and less snow and ice that is available as a source of fresh water for half the people in the world. That occurs about here, but you see where we're going is here. This is the Greenland ice sheet, which is already in the process of beginning to melt, but could go into catastrophic melting there. So this is a non-trivial amount of warming. And that's the best guess as to where we're going. Now, why we haven't seen it, it's quite interesting. If you um, take a satellite, this is a NASA satellite image of uh, the China region, you'd see the same in India, there is this atmospheric aerosol and black carbon cloud that's coming from the very rapid industrialization uh, of uh, China and that includes the growing of their automobiles as well as their factories and so forth. Uh, in fact, I was uh, in China in November and at that point on the ground on their uh, amazing high-speed train, it uh, goes 250 kilometers an hour, between Beijing and the coast, I took this picture. And you can see the, uh, and this was uh, after the cleanup uh, of the air for the Olympic Games, the uh, haze from the ground level that you can see there in the satellite. Now, Ramanathan, uh, as I say, is an amazing scientist. Uh, he, uh, uh, this is a picture from a Nature article uh, last year on his work, has created these unmanned um, UAVs uh, that are instrumented to measure the micron size scale of the black carbon and the aerosols at multiple levels simultaneously. And so he flies one you know, through the cloud, above the cloud, below the cloud, and so can get a very, very detailed, the, the most detailed measurements yet. And here's what he finds. If you look at the actual, there's a term scientists have called radiative forcing, which is the <clears throat> amount of um, impact on trapping the heat uh, that um, uh, comes from various things. Here's the CO2, <coughs> current CO2 levels. And then there are these other, when we, the reason we, we don't talk about just CO2, we call it greenhouse gases. Things like methane that come from um, cows, for instance, and, and, and rice paddies in Southeast Asia uh, is very much more capable of causing warming than CO2 per molecule. Um, and so you have to keep track of all these other ones, nitrous oxides and everything. And so you can see if you added these and these, that, that's the, the forcing function that's making them getting warm, warmer. Black carbon itself absorbs the sunlight and, and so also is warming. But here are the aerosols, and this is the IPCC's, uh, the, the group of international scientists measures, and here's Ramanathan's more uh, probably accurate measurements. And you can see that they're negative. So what the aerosols do is essentially um, blanket, uh, keep, uh, reflect the sunlight back and cools the earth. So the aerosols cause a cooling. And so you know every so often we have a volcano that goes off and then we have a cooler summer. That's the same kinds of aerosols that go sulfur dioxide and other kind of uh, sulfur compounds that go into the air. So what effectively is this is saying is as these power plants, say all these coal power plants, are putting all of this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that's warming things up, they're also putting all these aerosols and that's cooling things down. And uh, as, you know, as you know in China, politically the main thing now um, is uh, people are tired of the pollution and so there's local agitation throughout uh, China to clean up the air. And what Ramanathan's conclusion is, is that that seems like a good thing to do, right? There's a lot of health hazards that are associated with it. As you remove that cooling, the true heating that's left from the greenhouse gases will finally appear. 
And so that's why this 1.6 degrees that we were already committed to has yet to appear. The final factor is the thermal inertia of the oceans. It takes about 50 years for the oceans to equilibrate, and we're putting it in, we're, we're heating things up so fast that it, uh, the ocean can't uh, keep up. So it will, though, and then we'll have this full uh, 2.4 uh, degrees warming. So that's all I'm going to tell you about global warming. Um, if you look at it from, uh, I'll shift right now to the policy end of this as to what countries are doing about it. This is a, a map um, uh, in, uh, taken from Wikipedia that shows by color coding with red being higher the number of tons of CO2 equivalent per capita. Uh, we use CO2 equivalent, that is we take those other greenhouse gases and convert them to equivalent amounts of, of warming from CO2 and that's a term that is used in the business. Um, and the amazing thing is that the top three developed countries in the world, Australia, uh, Canada, and the US, uh, those are the top three that uh, uh, have the highest uh, emissions per capita. Now it turns out that there is a lot of reasons, as I'll show you, that Australia, the US, and Canada are natural partners in attacking the problem. But even if they weren't, they ought to be attacking the problem since they have the biggest version of it. Now you could say, well, that's per capita. What about China? Well, China, of course, is just now becoming equal to the US in its ability to do it. But it's less per capita, but there's more capita, so uh, that makes up for it. And, but you might think, well, Australia doesn't have any people, uh, you know, 12th of the US population or something. <coughs> but actually, according to the Australia Institute, if you just multiply the people times the per capita, uh, it's equivalent to France or Italy. Uh, in terms of uh, that have much larger populations. And it's just the intensity is so great in Australia. So Australia is uh, quite central to this. And I didn't realize that until I really got into this uh, a little bit more. Now Kevin Rudd uh, has made um, December 15th a major announcement about Australia's um, commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I thought this was quite an interesting quote that takes into account what is driving policy, which is the realization that Australia does have this very high per capita uh, carbon um, emission. And also that, at least in his mind and his advisor's minds, there is a clear coupling to the impact that climate change could have on Australia in a very negative fashion. Now the set of scientists worldwide who work on this, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, they have a policy document and it's fairly nuanced, but the recommendation that's most usually uh, pulled out, they say basically, see as you add more uh, CO2 equivalents, you get higher and higher and higher, um, and the temperature goes up, and at a certain point, you get to these tipping points, and nobody really knows what's going to happen because the whole nonlinear system is going to change in ways that are difficult to predict. So it's, life is hard enough dealing with the situation we've got, much less things we can't imagine. Um, and so the scientists say, basically, you want to keep it down below increasing above, you know, say 450 uh, or something like that. To do that would require a 25 to 50, 25 to 40 percent reduction below uh, global 1990 levels by 2020. So that would be the desirable thing to do if you don't want things to get out of hand, climate-wise, according to the scientists. So in California, two years ago, we passed what is called AB 32, and Governor Schwarzenegger uh, signed it September of 2006, and, and that is the law of the land in California. Right. So we have to obey the law. And that law says that we are going to reduce, one way or another, uh, by 2020, our emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, um, to our 1990 levels. Now that's if you say, okay, 
what's the level today? <laughs> and how big a deal is that? That's a 15% reduction. Now, 15% sounds like a small number. 15% is actually going to require Herculean efforts to meet um, because it'll have to change. That's, that's to put it in, I like this term, this way of thinking about it. Each of us has to reduce by four tons of CO2. Now, CO2 is a gas. So four tons of a gas is a lot. And each of us in California, every man, woman, and child, has to reduce our lifestyle emission of these greenhouse gases by four tons to get that 15%. That's what I mean about this is a big deal. OK, so now that says by 2020, we want to be back to where we were in 1990. That is not 25 to 40% below, right? So it's, in, in terms of the scientists, not that aggressive. The European Union is quite a bit more aggressive. Um, they've uh, adopted uh, in December. And you notice how December, that was like last month, this is happening as we speak. So uh, the European Union adopted uh, a need to reduce by 2020, 20% below the 1990. The much more aggressive and much more difficult to achieve. Now, Kevin Rudd uh, announced uh, December 15th that Australia was pledging to cut by 2020 5% uh, from its 2000 levels. Now, I've actually looked up the net emission because that's by 2000, so what is was it in, you know, 1990, so I can compare apples and apples. Turns out almost exactly the same. And a lot of that, these are net emissions, and a lot of that has to do with the reforestation program in Australia, which is a very important part of the, what's going on in Australia. And the CSIRO has a lot of very interesting information on that. But in any case, it's 5%, so it's about 5% below 1990 levels, a little more aggressive than California. Uh, but not as aggressive as the EU. <coughs> now, neither, interestingly enough, the US or Canada have adopted targets at this point. However, um, President-elect Obama has endorsed a goal for the United States that's similar to the AB32, namely rollback to 1990 levels. So now at this point, someone, you know, there are still plenty of people who, or there are still some people who think that there is scientific question about global warming and so forth, that's fine. That debate will continue among the scientific community as it should, and we will learn more and more. But at this moment in time, that's sort of a mute point because the governments around the world have decided it's true. They've legislated targets for their countries, and that's the law. So. Oddly enough, 2009 is the first year in which we enter a regime in which we go from a scientific debate to a policy implementation globally. And that's really important to think about because as long as you could sort of throw darts at the scientists, you didn't have to do anything. But once you have these laws, and by the way, if you look into it, this year and next year and the year after are the most important years because if we can make reductions early, you know, we have a chance of getting there. If you wait to the last minute, I mean, you just have to destroy the economy basically, I would assume, to be able to get it in the last, you know, few years. So political will is going to be the real test here. Can, can the countries come together inside themselves and with each other to find the will as well as the way to make this happen, I don't know. Now, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background as to um, what does it mean to the economy to do this. Um, as you can see, Australia has uh, about a half a gigaton, a gigaton is a billion tons, uh, of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, <clears throat> U.S. has about six gigatons, Australia about a half of one. So it has, again, this sort of 12 to 1 ratio that we think about in terms of population because we're both developed countries and 
you know, that's not un crazy. And here you can see in, in terms of where does that emission come from in Australia across your mining sector, manufacturing, and so forth. Here in the U.S., this is over time from 1990 until 2006. And again, you can see the very biggest one is uh, electricity generation. And that is the thing that dominates. So when you'll see me later talk about working on electrical distribution, it's because that's the long end of the stick. That's the thing that's causing the most emissions is the creation of electricity. And of course, coal-fired power plants are the thing to keep in mind, you know, keep in your head as an example of why that might be. However, transportation is right behind it. And, and so this is all of our ground and air and sea uh, transportation. And you can see industry actually is doing a pretty good job of uh, it's actually reducing its uh, emissions over a number of years, whereas transportation and electricity generation just continue to increase. Um, now down here, you'll see agriculture toward the bottom, but if you take these uh, two lines, which are commercial and residential real estate, the built infrastructure of our country, and you, you, you need to sort of stack those together, and you'd see that building accounts for about um, a, a major component of the emissions. So we'll come back to this. Is there something we can do about heating and cooling buildings? Is there something we can do about you know, producing and, and distributing electricity, and is there something we can do about transportation? Because those, that's what you have to be able to do if you're going to meet any of these goals. Now, fortunately, there's a very good study, and anyone who would like to know more about this subject, I really uh, recommend you just go on the web and download the PDF of this uh, study. Um, it's called Smart 2020, Enabling the Low Carbon Economy in the Information Age. And so I'll be picking um, a number of things from it. But what it concludes is that information and communication technology, ICT, is a key factor in the fight against climate change. And the reason is that although the contribution of ICT to climate change, which I'll talk about, is only a couple of percent of the total thing. The use of much more information technology for sensing, for communication, for real-time con control, say, of smart grids, uh, smart electricity grids, and so forth, as we roll that out, that can um, effectively, according to this study, reduce uh, total emissions globally by 15%, which would, you know, if you could do that, would be a way that you could get to the kind of uh, goals that have been set by the countries around the world. But there's a kind of a funny paradox here. <clears throat> if you say ICT, we're going to greatly expand the use of it, that we don't have smart cars and smart grids and all this stuff, you know, we're going to have a lot more of it, but then it has its own carbon footprint. So unless it drastically reduces now <laughs> its carbon emissions, that is the, mainly for the electricity to run it and the cooling, air conditioning to keep it cool, unless we can drastically reduce that, we can't use it, right? Because we'll be generating even more from the use of the IT even while we're reducing it in the application. So this is the paradox. So the first thing I want to look at is just the um, footprint itself of all of the computers and PCs and um, cell phones and TVs and uh, all of this stuff put together, all the internet. Um, and you can see it's about 2% of the total output. But look how fast it's growing, right? That's the problem is that it's about the same as the aviation industry, but the use, as you know, of computers is just extraordinarily expanding. And so that means that as it's a driver for more emissions, it's just getting higher and higher. Now, in Australia, at the University of Melbourne, you've got a center for ultra-broadband, and Rod uh, Tucker is one of the top people in the world in actually studying this problem. 
and he's collaborating with us as a result of having met him through the good services of AALD. Uh, and uh, he points out that when you start looking at the internet as a whole, there are all these components. There are the data centers, there's the uh, video distribution networks, there's the cable modems to your home or, or DSL, there's the telecom mm -hmm. uh, network. And so you have to sort of put your arms around all of this. It's been extraordinary to watch how quickly industry is, re is um, reacted to this. So these are all from uh, just the last year or so. Sun, Hewlett Packard, Google, Intel, Microsoft, IBM, uh, all are, you know, not, they don't need to be convinced at this point. They are running down the field as fast as they can, trying to find ways to make what they sell greener. But it's a tough problem. This is an IBM chart, and down here are years, okay? And this is the heat flux coming from a chip. And the good news is the chips are getting faster. The way they're doing that is shrinking them, which means it's harder to get the heat out. And so this red curve is, um, shows that the chips are getting hotter and hotter. And this is why you, you know how you keep you hear the fans on your PC, they seem to get louder and louder. That's because the PC is getting hotter and hotter each year, and you have to cool it, right? And that cooling <coughs> takes electricity, and the generation of electricity makes carbon emissions, right? So it's a tough problem. But uh, here in Silicon Valley, there is something called the Leadership Group. And so again, they took this on and uh, pulled together something like 17 different data centers and went in and instrumented them and measured all this. And what you can see is, in terms of the kilowatts uh, per year, this is the growth rate that data centers, that is places that have all these racks of computers and storage and so forth, um, that's what, you know, when you do a Google search, you're going out to hundreds of thousands of computers that are in these data centers and um, they run the internet. And so naturally, as the internet usage increases and increases, this is, a, this is the line. Now, in 2006, this would be where we would have been going. And that extra electricity to run all those data centers would be driving more carbon emissions. But the industry as a whole has gotten together, and you can see that actually this curve down in here is what the Silicon Valley group is finding that the most advanced data centers are doing. That is, they're aggressively <coughs> reducing their electricity uses even as the number of these centers and their power increases, their, their compute power. It's quite amazing to see how quickly the industries have and the data centers have, have reacted. Now, the universities are a big part of this. I run an institute, um, the California Institute for Information Technology, and uh, telecommunications and Information Technology, CalIT2. We have a sister one that Berkeley runs called Citrus, and they work together. They have this little uh, sensor chip that they developed, and they work with Hewlett Packard to, by knowing the temperature everywhere in the machine room, they can redirect how they do the air and so forth and make it much more energy efficient. And Hewlett Packard has now taken that research and is actually now selling products for clean rooms that use it all in just a couple of years. Okay. So this is something that is a, a quite um, a good to see the universities working with industry that way. The federal labs are another good example. I was just up at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Washington State, and they've <coughs> developed this very instrumented smart data center. Um, and the idea is that this lets them have a laboratory for all these, you know, every little bit of efficiency you can <laughs> squeeze out of the thing helps. But where do you go to do that? And the federal labs, the DOE labs, um, are such a place. Now at our campus, at UCSD, we're trying to be a little bit more radical. What we're saying is, you know, if you look at, if you went around Stanford and you uh, went into any given department, you'd find the professors had squirreled away um, a cluster, a uh, PC cluster, to do their computing on, or to store their data. And it'd be in the chemistry department, and the biology department, and it'd be over in the School of Medicine, and it'd be everywhere. Well, those are all, of course, very ill air conditioned, very poor uh, electricity, uh, you know, et cetera. So what if we 
re-centralize those in the most advanced mm. ability to uh, cool them and heat them efficiently and so forth, and then just use optical fibers to move the bits around. So what do you care whether you, you know, your cluster is in your room as long as you have a very high speed optical fiber linked, and by high speed I'm talking about 10,000 megabits a second compared to the one to 10 megabits a second you get at home, one to 10 megabits, this is 10,000 megabits a second. So it's essentially instantaneous as far as you can tell. Well, what we're doing is we're working with Sun Microsystems and Sun, actually it's a very odd thing. See this thing? It's an international cargo container. Those things they stack up, you know, on all those, when you see the boats coming into Long Beach or, or whatever. Um, but they remade it into a machine room and so it's got eight racks uh, in it and what we're doing is instrumenting this stuff um, and then we're able to go through and do all kinds of computer science experiments on it, computer architectures uh, and visualization, power and thermal management and I won't go into any detail but just to show you examples, here's a little like you put this in your USB port and this is what the amount of power your PC normally consumes, this is if it's sleeping and this is if it's fully running, but you got this little widget we, one of our professors created. And what it does is it goes in and it keeps track of everything going on in your software. And when you're not using something, turns it off. <laughs> okay. Well, now, why did they develop this? Because the PCs, have, you know, are using so much energy. Did you realize that the the video game consoles around the world use as much electricity as all of San Diego? So, so there, these are these opportunities that uh, exist. Virtualization, I won't get into too much here, it's just that what you're saying, instead of, instead of I'm running this, my application on my computer, you just so, throw your application into internet space, it finds the right computers to do it on, and so it can make much more efficiently package the applications into the computers. Um, we have a whole, um, project at Cali 2 with the entertainment industry called um, Cinegrid. Uh, this is a picture of a um, opera in Netherlands stream live over these optical fibers uh, to us. And so we're working with all of the studios in, in, uh, in Hollywood, um, many of the international ones, to figure out how are they going to continue to make movies but in a fully digital way in which the bits are flowing around the world to the little, uh, you know, special effects houses and coming back to the director the next morning and, and so forth. They're going to use all this IT, but how can they do that without the footprint of the carbon emissions getting so great that they might get legislated against? <laughs> so we have this huge research project, this public-private partnership. And then finally, it's so this is all energy efficiency, but what if you just did a completely out of the box thing? What could we maybe just go to where we had no carbon footprint and still got all our computing and storage done? And this is Bill St. Arnaud, who is the great leader of this thinking in Canada. And, and what he has said is, well, see, if you actually use electricity that's generated in a green fashion so that it doesn't emit carbon dioxide. That means you could use solar power, hydro, nuclear power, and depending on how you think about it, if you use biofuels where um, you know, you, the growing the fuel sucks CO2 out of the air because plants live off of carbon dioxide, give off oxygen, that's why you've got something to breathe. And um, and then when you harvest them and burn them, of course you put the CO2 back in, but it's roughly the same as they took out in the first place. So you're not causing a net change. So imagine that you have electrical power generators doing that. Well, what if you just put your data center right there next to that, like next to a hydro plant in Canada, and that's what we're doing. We're planning on working with Canada to try out. Australia, actually, I talked to the uh, CSIRO, and they said, we've got hydro plants, we want to do this. Okay, so um, 
then you just use the electricity that's generated and the cooling from like the Columbia River uh, where Google, you've heard, has put uh, their big data centers. Um, and then you don't have any carbon emission. That's pretty good, right? And so, but then how do you get the bits to where they need to go? Well, you, again, you use these optical fibers. We had, the, we had Amazon CTO in yesterday talking to us uh, about a possible experiment using their big uh, computing cloud um, in this kind of experiment. So, so the idea of just separating to, of, of actually, imagine that you, we even have things where, okay, so there's solar is only good during the day, and then wind, like in California, is only good at night. But if they have data centers at all these things, you just sort of move the work to follow the sun and follow the wind. Now that's a little different than we think about doing things today, but that's the kind of out-of-the-box thinking that you're beginning to see. Okay, but again, that's just to clean up ICT enough that we can use it for other things. Because remember, it's only 2% or so of the emission, whereas we're going for 15%. Well, the way we get that is, again, this is going back to the SMART 2020 report, that, that by use of this in smart electrical grids, in smart transportation systems, in smart buildings, and replacing travel like we did to get to this meeting with virtual meetings, you can save five times the footprint carbon footprint of the ICT that you're using. And here's just the numbers of their estimates. Uh, and over here is the percentage of what 2020 um, emissions would be, somewhere between 13 and 22 percent, depending on how you, you do it. Now, um, just quickly go through each of these things. The uh, smart electrical goods, Obama, just from a speech that he gave, um, six days ago, um, said that um, updating the way we get our electricity by starting to build a new smart grid will save us money, protect <clears throat> our power sources from blackout or attack, and deliver clean alternative forms of energy to every corner of the nation. So smart grids, you, how many of you have now have a smart meter at your, at your house? You know, the, the power company is going around beginning to install all those things. So that means that you'll, in a few years, you will know, it will be made visible to you, the price of your house per second for the use of electricity. And you will get very good, just like if you drive a Prius and you have the feedback of that cool little display that's showing you whether you're charging the battery or whether you're using the engine and you learn to drive in a way that uses the battery as much as possible, and that gets, because the game is to get your, you know, the bragging rights of your miles per gallon as high as possible, and the plug-in Priuses are gonna make it even more so. Um, but that's your car. What about your house, <laughs> you know? And so this is the same thing. You're gonna have all of your appliances and your air conditioning and your wine cellar and your spa and every, whatever, uh, all metered in probably a little keyboard, and, and then you'll have software that allows you to, say, raise the thermostat when it costs more during the day for electricity, and then you know, change it back at night when it's, and it's uh, cheaper. Now, Cal IT2 is in a good position to work on this because when we started out, our whole concept was to uh, get all kinds of professors and, and networked infrastructures and new materials and everything, but then understand how to apply uh, changes in information technology and telecommunication to the environment, civil infrastructure, transportation, and the entertainment complex, and to hook together, the, in other words, the applications of this with the people who understand all the new cool things about IT that are coming along, and then form teams, which normally don't exist, to study that. So here's what we're doing. Say you want your car. Cars are a huge part of the mess. Anybody who lives in LA uh, understands this. Um, well, guess what? 
the, the 90 percent of all automobile innovations are now software driven. You have over 10 million lines of code in your car. You know that? <laughs> you have 100 microprocessors, sensors, actuators, five different networks. That's a modern car. And so the only way it's going to get greener other than maybe you can reduce a little bit more the materials, you know, make them a little lighter, but then of course you have to make them more crash worthy. So that's a tough one to get much out of. It's going to be software. I mean, think about it, you know, how, do, how, does, how does your car, does your electronic fuel injection work? It's software. So it's, it's, it's monitoring the complex stuff going on in your engine and then it's, it's, it's doing all kinds of things to you know, make your fuel high, uh, miles per hour, miles per gallon better, or reducing your emissions, right? Well, we have at Cal 2 now for several years got all of the car manufacturers, most of all the dominant car manufacturers, their software architects to a meeting to talk to each other about this. And so we've sort of created this community of folks. And one thing we're going to be doing in the next meeting is focusing them on how to make the cars greener. How many saw who killed the electric car? Okay, you all ought to see it. It's a great, great DVD. We actually lived through this process in the 2000s. These are our cute little electric cars that we had as part of our zero emission vehicle. The California Air, Qual Air Resources Board, for a short time, had a regulation that something like 10% of the fleet of cars was going to have to be zero emission, and then they changed it under political pressure, uh, and that's what this movie is all about. And this all happened in, in the 2000s. And the electric cars, which were made by General Motors, they had this really great electric car, Toyota. The car makers came back and seized them all and crushed them and disappeared them. But we had them. Here I am, right? <laughs> you know, we were. This was. We were very proud of this. We had these things because we have this Institute for Transportation Studies at Irvine, and um, since then we've now got the plug-in Prius uh, at UC Irvine, which is half of the institute that I run, being in San Diego. Um, you won't be able to buy these still for a couple of years. But we've got them and we're testing them out and trying to optimize them and working again with the vendors to do that. We also have, um, you know, to the, main, uh, the main ways that cars are adding to global carbon emission is sitting in the freeway, not moving. <laughs> That's when your, your car is just sitting there producing constantly all this emissions and you're not going anywhere, right? So reducing traffic <coughs> congestion is critical. So we've developed this thing that goes to the website, reads out from Caltrans the instantaneous state of the freeway that they have from all those induction coils. They know how fast the cars are going. You can go to the web and find out a place, and it's you know it's like this this highway's green, this one's red because it's all. Well, we get all that information. Then you just call with your cell phone these numbers. These are free numbers. You say five north, and it will tell you. The voice will do speech synthesis from having gone to the web, figured out which freeways are below the speed limit, and tell you the instantaneous speed limit. So then you re, you know, direct where you're driving uh, based on that. And we have a thousand calls a day, something like that, of people who are hooked up. We even have it where you can go on the website, put in where your home is, where your business is, and it, this will page you or send a BlackBerry message to you and say, "Leave home now." <laughs> leave for home now because uh, it keeps track of, of all the roads and all the traffic and then a computer projects when is the best time for you to get home. Finally, what are we going to do about telepresence, you know, being able to um, have virtual meetings? Well, Cisco is a partner of ours and they probably have the best selling commercial product uh, called the telepresence system. How many of you ever used one of these things? They're, they're really quite amazing how good they are. Um, well, they've been just, there were none of them a couple of years ago. There's now over 300 of them worldwide. But here's the thing I love. They, <coughs> Cisco keeps track of the 
cubic meters of emissions saved as a metric for using these things. So in other words, they avoided 31,000 meetings so far that would have taken travel. That's the same as taking 15,000 cars off the road. And so what I love is, this is a Cisco slide, their marketing department has figured out that the metric to explain to people why this is a good idea is how much emissions are being saved. Now, this is Cal IT2. Here's me uh, actually up at Irvine. Here's my Irvine director. Here's my San Diego director. This is another one called Life Size, another commercial system. Polycom, Tanberg, various of these have these high definition systems now. And we just use them all the time. We, we have, any given day, we have half a dozen or are more high definition teleconference sessions going on. Um, and does it save travel? Yes, here I am giving a talk to Monash University uh, in Melbourne uh, from um, Cal IT2 using this high definition linkage that we've set up. So I'll just sort of wrap it up here uh, pretty quickly. Um, as I think most of you know, I was the principal investigator of this large NSF grant called the Optiputer, which was trying to figure out how you can use these fiber optics to have these very high speed 10,000 megabit per second um, uh, con connections around the world. Uh, here's an example of it. We made these tiled walls, and then here are high definition. This, is a, this picture is taken in San Diego. Here's a group in Chicago. Here's another group in Michigan. They're all seeing each other. They're all sharing their data back and forth. So it's way beyond just you know talking head teleconferences. And in supercomputing in November, which is the annual big conference in the US, we had Amsterdam, Korea, Japan, Queensland, Russia, Czech Republic, all linked up like this. And here's the actual bandwidth in tens of, mil tens of thousands, tens of gigabits. So this is 10,000 uh, megabits a second, 20,000 megabits a second. So roughly 1,000 times what you're used to using. And it works today, right? And we were using this over commercial fiber optic and so forth. So this shows you that, that things are, are closer than you might think. So what I'm proposing is that we build on the fact that Australia and the US and Canada have some of the most advanced of these fiber optic systems. And that's what I've been working with Australia for the last year and a half on, um, to build a um, ICT uh, green ICT test bed that connects Australia, the US, and Canada. It's a quite natural configuration from the existing footprints of the network. Um, this creates what I call an optiputer, optiplanet collaboratory. And actually using this green technology to avoid travel. Here's the picture that many of you were involved in of uh, the great hookup. Um, it's hard to believe it was only a year ago. <laughs> I feel like that. I feel like I feel like we've aged more than a year since then. There's been so much happening, uh, but this was the great link up of uh, this is a picture taken in the San Diego, UC San Diego Cal IT2 Buildings Auditorium, and this, of course, is the University of Melbourne coming in as if they're in the room with us. Well, then Phil asked me to be the um, leadership dialogue scholar in October. Uh, these are this is the schedule of my road show, if you like. And each of these universities, we linked them up. We got them to build these, these optiportals, these walls, uh, link up with RNET, uh, the Australian Advanced Research Network. Uh, and um, whereas there was only one of these optiportals uh, last year at this time, uh, there are seven today. And uh, there'll be 10, I'm sure, very quickly. CSIRO, many of the universities are using them. At the same time that that was going on, we signed a memo of understanding with Canada because we have, much like the AALD, uh, we have this uh, Canadian-Californian strategic innovation partnership. So just like there's a West Coast dialogue with California, um, uh, and actually up through Seattle, uh, and Australia, we've got the similar thing going with Canada. 
So we, we signed an MOU. Here's the signing of it in uh, Montreal. Uh, this is Jerry Sheehan who works for me. Um, I was, at that point, I had some family issues I had to deal with back home, but I couldn't be there to sign it. I would have otherwise. But this is a green ICT MOU to work on all kinds of aspects of green, uh, greening the ICT. And um, the, of course, way you do this is you have symposiums to bring the best brains in the world together on this. Uh, I'm proud to say Australia was the, kicked this off last November uh, in Melbourne with their symposium on sustainability of the internet and ICT. And next week, we will have the first California conference like this that is between the California Public Utility Commission, first time they've ever worked with a university like this I know of. Uh, and we have um, that meeting will be at Cal IT2 next week. Hmm. So there's a lot going on here to understand how the way forward, Australia, California, and Canada, I think, are the natural leaders. The European Union is also doing things we probably will expand to link with them, but I think there's a very natural working relationship between Australia, the US, and Canada that we should use. I'll just end with this. I think all of you are familiar with The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman. He's got a new book out. And for those of you who would like to really dig into this a little bit more and to understand the unbelievable, almost unimaginable challenge that faces us, that Friedman is very well lays out for you, uh, get the book and, and, and read it. I'll just give you one quote from it, that to do, to undertake, uh, to, re to reduce these emissions at the level we've been talking about will be the biggest single peacetime project humankind will ever have undertaken. And it will be against the clock. So <clears throat> this, is, this is not going to be simple. But the thing that encourages me is to see, because of the ALD, so much is already underway. You've got so many people working on this. And I think if you take the level of innovation that we've seen drive the miracle of Silicon Valley that Stanford has been such a leader in, applied to solving this problem with innovative green technologies, um, there's a very good chance that we will not only do that, but we will end up with a world that's a much better world to live in in many, many ways. Thanks. Thank you, Larry.